Welcome to episode four of I Thought I Knew How, a podcast about knitting and life and all sorts. I'm your host, Anne Frost, and this episode was recorded on March 9th, 2019. Today I'd like to talk to you some about the first and second swatches for the Master Knitter program and some musings that came out of working on them. I'll also talk about the projects I've been working on since I last spoke to you, and I have a product review to share. Have you ever wanted to try a Nostapina? Well, I had a chance to, and I'll tell you all about it. I also have a small appeal for information as I prepare for a trip to London, that plus some music to knit by. If you'd like to get in touch with me, you can email me at anne at familypodcasts.com. That's Anne with an E at familypodcasts.com. The show notes are available at I thought I knew how dot familypodcasts.com. And you can find the show on various social media platforms as I thought I knew how. I want to start today by thanking those of you who responded to my plea for help in finding a basic sock pattern so I could start working on sock knitting skills in advance of level two of the Master Knitter program. My friend Michelle recommended the Hermione's Everyday Socks designed by Emily Lauder, or Luder, not quite sure, that are available as a free pattern on Ravelry. I like that it appears to be a basic, straightforward sock design, but still has some textured stitches to it, so I don't run the risk of total boredom as I knit them. So I have that pattern saved, and the yarn picked out and ready to go. Nancy of Dragonfly Fibers suggested I pick up a copy of Stephanie Pearl McPhee's Knitting Rules book, which has a sock recipe inside. So I have that on order from Amazon and am waiting eagerly for it to arrive. Thank you so much for taking the time to reach out. I have made a little progress on the work for the Master Knitter program. I knit and blocked swatches one and two, which were respectively a two by two rib followed by garter stitch and a one by one rib followed by stockinette stitch. All of this was old hat to me, but I did take the time to watch a few videos on YouTube about how to make sure your ribbing is neat and then I cast on and knit the swatches according to the instructions, blocked swatch one, and began going through my books to find the required two references for every technique that was used to knit it. And that is where my problems started to arise. As I was going through the books looking for a reference to 2 by 2 knitting, I saw in multiple books that the authors highly recommend knitting ribbing with needles several sizes smaller than the needle you intend to use in the main areas of the project, because moving the yarn from the back to the front and vice versa over and over again results in extra yarn being factored into the stitches, and the stitches of the ribbing end up looking very large compared to the stitches in the rest of the project. I didn't think much of it when I saw it in one book. In the second book, it made me pause. And by the third reference to this technique, I started to panic a little. Was this one of the things I was meant to learn on my own as I studied? I got on the Ravelry group for the Master Knitting program and tried searching and couldn't find any reference to people going down a few needle sizes for ribbing. I asked a few people who had finished level one if they had gone down to smaller needles with their ribbing, and none of them had, so you would think that that would be the end of it, but no. (laughs) I think I've established that I tend to panic sometimes. (laughs) My husband came in the room while I was casting on again to test what going down a few needle sizes would do to the look of the ribbing. And I explained to him that I had knit two swatches before I'd actually looked at any of the technique information in the books like I was supposed to. And then I'd learned this new thing about ribbing that I should have read about before I started. And he laughed a little and said I should talk about it on the podcast and name the episode Son of a. (laughs) In the end, I re-knit and blocked swatch one. That was the one that's two by two ribbing followed by garter stitch. My first go was knit on size 8 needles, and it worked up to 20 stitches. The second attempt was knit with 6s for the ribbing and 8s for the body, and it knit up to 18 stitches. So my gauge on the first swatch was at the tighter end of the range for my yarn, and the second one was at the looser end of the gauge range, and neither matched the gauge of the preliminary swatch. So that added to my concern. 
but how did it actually affect the look of the ribbing to go down to a smaller size? I will say that they both looked fine. (laughs) Yes, the stitches in the ribbing in the first swatch were slightly larger than when I knit it with the sixes, but the difference was negligible, and I think if I didn't call your attention to it, most people wouldn't notice. However, I also re-knit swatch two with the Knit One Pearl One ribbing. In the original swatch, the difference between the sizes of the stitches in the ribbing versus the stockinette was dramatic. So I went down to a size five needle for the ribbing, and as a result, the ribbing stitches were only ever so slightly larger than the stockinette area. It looks much better on swatch two, to have used much smaller needles. So I'm going to move forward with my original swatch one where everything was knit with size eight needles and with swatch two, I'm actually going to knit it one more time because while I think I nailed it with the ribbing by going down to a size five, the stockinette on that swatch has some noticeable issues with rowing out and it won't be the end of the world to just give that swatch one more try. I do need to figure out what I'm going to do with all these extra swatches, though. (laughs) We'll have to see how many I end up with by the end of this. There are several other fixes out there for wonky ribbing, and I'll share two more that I learned about that worked for me. Often with knit two, purl two ribbing, the knit stitch to the left ends up noticeably larger than the one to the right. Again, this is because when we move the yarn from back to front, We incorporate a little extra yarn into the stitch. And also, those of us who throw the yarn knit pearls by wrapping the yarn counterclockwise and knits clockwise. And as a result, our pearls have slightly more yarn than knits. And in ribbing, this all results in that second knit stitch looking much larger than the first. One fix that helped me was working the first purl stitch by wrapping the yarn clockwise under the needles instead of over. And then on the way back, I had to remember to knit that stitch through the back because it sits on the needle oriented in the wrong direction. But it's very easy to see where that happens and and you'll know that, oh, that's the one I have to knit through the back. Another thing that helped is after each purl stitch, I took the yarn to the back again and gave it a gentle tug with my tension finger. I didn't pull too hard because I didn't want to distort the stitches from earlier. I just wanted to take up any extra slack in the yarn before I then brought the yarn forward again to work the next purl stitch. After the second purl stitch, I moved the yarn to the back, still give it that gentle tug before working the next knit stitch. Between these two alterations to my form and switching to the smaller needles for the knit one purl one ribbing, my rib stitches look much nicer and I am not as worried about the judges seeing them. Let's take a quick break for some music. All this talk of ribbing has me itching for my needles. This is a track by Jason Shaw, available on the Free Music Archive. A nice mellow little piece with enough energy to keep you moving comfortably through your stitches.
the whole incident with the ribbing got me thinking, as my knitting often does. I went into this exercise convinced that level one of the program was going to amount to basically a bunch of knitting of things I already know how to knit, accompanied by a bunch of paperwork that would basically show that I knew how to find things I already knew in reference materials. And I'd send it in and it would all get approved and I could move on to level two where the real challenge would start. Instead, I'm learning that my own ego is making this process much harder than it needs to be. Had I done the research before knitting the swatches instead of after, I wouldn't be in a position where I kept reading more information that sent me into a panic that I did something wrong. It can often be very difficult to question our own abilities and notions about ourselves. I'm currently reading through John Locke's An Essay Concerning Human Understanding with my daughter, who's a junior in high school. I never read it in school, and I find it interesting that the universe has contrived to put it in my hands at this moment in time when this program is making me question some perceptions I have about myself. Locke put forth an argument in his essay that humans do not come to Earth with innate understanding that the things we think are universally understood as part of our humanness are actually lessons we learn so early in life that we forget having learned them, and then we come to think of them as innate knowledge that all people share. He goes on to argue that because all knowledge is learned, we should take the time now and again to think deeply about those things we think of as universal truths or innate knowledge or sure understanding and weigh them against our life experiences and understandings that we've acquired. Are they worth holding up as truths? Should we be shaping our lives and behaviors around these things? And I want to add that questioning and thinking about these things does not mean we are looking to dismiss or replace them. Oftentimes, these early life lessons are taught to us because they work so well because they have been tested out by generations of people who came before us. The act of thinking deeply about them, of questioning them, may sometimes result in our dismissing them, but often the result is that we develop a better understanding and appreciation for them. We allow them to sink more deeply into our character. This may seem like a silly connection to make to knitting ribbing, and I suppose it is, but my egoistic tendency to follow my current understanding and then look for sources to back up what I already know feels like a less metaphysically loaded version of not wanting to learn about the basic morality of my culture. <laughs> Humans like to be right. Being wrong is tied to fear and shame for many of us. Over the last six months or so, I've tried to be slower to speak less inclined to assume, more willing to listen to the ideas of others before offering my own, and open about when I don't know things. This might seem like a list of little self-improvement exercises, but it's really been an act of challenging how I perceive myself as someone who is naturally good at things or who has this life stuff figured out. Now it seems that I can take this a step further and challenge the perception I have of myself as someone who is quite good at knitting, thank you, and doesn't need to be told how to do it properly. Or at least to be open to the idea that one can be good at something and also have areas that could use improvement. So that's what I've been thinking of this week, questioning both the big things in life and the way I face the little things. I'd like to tell you about Honey. Honey is a free app you can install on your desktop that will help you save money when you shop online. It will search Amazon for cheaper options and track price changes for things you're interested in. It also keeps track of coupon codes for websites and will test them out for you in online checkouts to find the one that will give you the best deal. Not only that, but you can earn Honey Points toward gift cards, toward popular online stores like Amazon and Sephora by shopping on other websites like Expedia. You don't have to alter your online shopping habits at all. You just install Honey and it will pop up when you go to qualifying online stores to let you know about deals or points you qualify to earn. 
I've been using Honey for over a year now, and I've earned several gift cards and saved tons of money on Amazon alone. If you visit the show notes for episode four at I thought I knew how dot com and use my link to sign up, Honey will provide me with a modest finder's fee at no cost to you that will help pay for the running of the podcast. Remember, I never recommend an affiliate I don't use myself. Visit the show notes for episode four at I thought I knew how dot family dot com to sign up and thank you for supporting the show. I've been going through a steady stream of one skein wonders and otherwise small projects. I have knit three cowls because I have a serious problem and I may need an intervention. I apparently cannot help myself. (laughs) It's cold and I have very short hair and so the need for neck warmth is great. (laughs) The first one I finished is Sensilla, designed by Shireen Nadir. It hugs around your neck but also sort of snuggles down onto your shoulders a bit, and the front then comes down to a point over the bust. There are cables that form the edging on either side of the point that come up the edge around your shoulders and then meet and travel in a straight line up the back of the neck portion. I loved it, and I loved it even more that it said gauge was unimportant because surely it meant I didn't have to waste time doing a swatch, And I'm sure you know where I'm going with this. (laughs) I finished knitting it and put it on and gauge did apparently matter because rather than slouching down on my shoulders, it stands straight up along my neck and the point just sort of lies out without really draping against my body at all. (laughs) It was so depressing And always swatch is one of the lessons I'm meant to have learned by now, but I have not, apparently. All is not lost. I think I have a smaller family member who might be able to pull it off better than I can, and I've already got the yarn to knit myself another. It should be the next thing I cast on. We'll see. After that, I took one evening and knit up a cowl using Sirdar Alpine that I picked up at Margie's Yarn Crafts. It's a faux fur slash novelty yarn that knits up unlike any novelty yarn I've ever felt. It's truly soft and scrumptious in all the right ways. Margie had a cowl knit up in this store that reminded me of being four or five years old and having friends on the street who had real fur muffs when they were children and how I just wanted one so, so bad. I never did get one, and I thought it was silly to even think about now. But when I went back to the shop again for something else and it was still there calling to me, I knew I should just get it. I knit up a rib stitch cowl on size 15 needles using two balls of the Alpine. It took me just a few hours, and now it's my go-to cowl when I have to leave the house or type at my computer or just, you know, exist somewhere. It's furry and I love it. Finally, I started and finished the Apis Florea cowl that was a March knit along run by Skane Walker on Ravelry and Instagram. I ended up using some alpaca I bought on a trip to Peru a few years ago, so I knew I wasn't going to be able to block it as vigorously as Skane Walker had with her sample cowl worked in wool. So I increased the width of the cowl by one repeat of the pattern and decreased the number of times I knit through the pattern rotation by one. The lace was nice to knit because for 10 rounds, the pearls all stack on top of each other, and then they shift, and for 10 rounds, the pearls all stack on top of each other again. So it was very quick and easy to see if I'd made a mistake in the lace, and I could fix it quickly without too much fuss. The lace pattern is reminiscent of bees wings and hives and knit up in the alpaca. It's very soft and very warm like a good winter cowl should be. If you'd like to take a look at any of these projects, plus a crocheted shawl that I just finished blocking this morning, you can find me on Instagram or Ravelry as I thought I knew how. I have another song for you from Arthur Nicholson, the singer-songwriter from Shetland who was also featured in episode three of the podcast. 
This one is Ready to Go from his album Sticks and Stones, available for purchase at his site, arthurnicholson.co.uk. I ordered this album myself and have had his song stuck in my head all week. I'm going to pick up my sticks and I'll meet you on the other side. Sits on the surface Can't walk away when you feel that you have earned it How deep do you have to take to see the hole you were filling I'll help you climb out but you have to be willing the Sticks and stones you throw your own bones You'll lock and load You're ready to go Nowhere Why can't you accept All the damage you were doing There's no way to pick Between the truth and lies You were spewing I care not for the things you care to mention Is there nowhere else you could give your attention? Sticks and stones you throw the lonely break your own bones You'll lock and load, you're ready to go A few more things before I go. First, I'd like to talk about a very useful tool that came to me the other day. Knitter's Pride sent me a Nostapinna to try out and offer a review of. It looks like a beefy Harry Potter wand. <laughs> Mine is about a foot long. The bottom four inches or so form a handle and the remaining eight or so inches is a smooth wooden rod that tapers toward the end. About a quarter of an inch from the top, there's a groove running around it. They are used to wind yarn into a center pull ball, just as a typical modern ball winder would. And when I say just as, I mean that. With a little practice, you can get your yarn balls to look just like that sort of short column yarn cake look that's produced in a ball winder. The first time I heard of Nostapinas, I honestly thought I would have no use for one. I already own a ball winder and a Swift, so I have a way to wind center pole balls already, 
And even when the opportunity arose to receive one to review, I sort of waffled about whether or not I was interested. I wanted to try one, but I don't like having things around that I don't use. So I didn't want to just use it a few times for the novelty of it and then have it sitting around collecting dust. In the end, I read somewhere that they were a handy thing to have when you're traveling and buying yarn in a hank that you'll want to use on your trip. And I do have a trip coming up where I will be visiting a handful of yarn shops, and I thought I could justify testing it as an item for knitting on the go. It arrived, and I stared at it for a week with no intention of using it until I was in the airport at least. (laughs) And then the opportunity to procrastinate arose. (laughs) Rather than doing the thing I needed to do but didn't want to, I decided I really should test this Nostapina before I go on my trip in case it doesn't work out. I don't want to be carting it around in my luggage for no reason. So I got it out and went to YouTube. There are a lot of videos out there that show you how to use a Nostapina. Some are more helpful and informative than others. I will link you to the one I found most helpful in the show notes. The basic method is to leave a long tail while you wrap the yarn around the groove at the top a few times, and then holding the tail along the side of the nostopinna, you wrap the yarn coming from the hank around the nostopinna four or five times, which locks that tail into place, and then you hold the nostopinna in your left hand and wrap the yarn diagonally around it from low to high with your right. As your right hand is swooping around the nostopinna, your left hand slowly turns it continually in one direction. I found it easiest to have the yarn hank open and spread out to the right of me as I wound. You could put the hank on a swift if you like, but the back of a chair would work, or you could just do what I did and just spread the hank out and pay attention to it as you wind and straighten it out as you need to. As I wound, I held the nostopinna at about a 45 degree angle and made contact with the wood at the top and bottom of the ball that began to form. With it angled that way, my right hand could make more of a vertical circle in the air with the nostopinna in the center, slowly turning and building up the ball. The result looked much more like an egg shape. If I angled it more, to about 60 degrees and didn't worry about touching the winding yarn to the wood as I went, then the yarn ball formed more of that column-like yarn cake ball that you get from a modern ball winder. When I reached the end of the yarn, I held the bit that was wrapped around the groove and slid it and the ball of yarn off the end. That bit from the groove was the start of the center pull and the yarn was ready to go. So what do I think of it? Well, I will say this. I do not regret owning a nostopinna. First of all, sometimes I just don't want to get out my ball winder in Swift, especially when I'm working with hanks with lower yardages, like a bulkier yarn. So having a simpler to handle option like the nostopinna is great. Secondly, I know how to wind a center pole ball just using my hands, but they come out round. And being able to wind the yarn into a yarn cake like a ball winder does, really helps to keep the yarn in place better when I'm working with it. Also, I really can see this being an asset when I'm traveling. The Nostopinna is very lightweight and it's wooden, so it's only adding slightly to my luggage weight and it's not going to set off any airport alarms. And I like the idea of being able to wind yarn I buy while traveling into a neat cake rather than in a rolly ball. And of course, there's the price factor. If you're just getting started with knitting or crochet, you probably don't want to shell out anywhere between $70 and $200 to buy a ball winder and Swift. The Knitter's Pride Nostopinna runs about $13 to $30 depending on the type of wood that it's made from. You can then drape your yarn over the back of a chair for free and wind it on your $13 Nostopinna in the beginning. And if your new hobby sticks, you can invest in a ball winder and Swift down the line. I also just really enjoyed the process of using it. There are tools out there that ground us. They remind us of those who have gone before and times when we didn't have as many of the conveniences we have now. Just as people like to cook out on an open fire from time to time or, I don't know, knit their own clothing, 
Using an Ostapenna teaches a little bit of gratitude for those who went before and for the things that we have access to now. I can see myself using it every now and then just to feel that sense of being rooted. As I said, I will link you to a video that helped me the most in the show notes, and I'll throw in a link to where you can pick up your own Knitter's Pride Nostopinna if you would like to give one a try. Finally, before I go, uh, I am in the middle of planning a trip to London, Windsor, and Bath in April with one of my daughters. She does knit, but her main love is sewing. While we are in Bath, we plan to visit Wool and Country Threads, which are a yarn store and a fabric store very conveniently located almost directly across the street from one another. While we're in London, we're going to make a trip to the village haberdashery, which is a little out of our way, but is a combined fabric and yarn shop that looks like a wonderful place to linger for an hour or two. We'll be hitting the Fashion Museum in Bath as well as the Fashion and Textile Museum and the Victoria and Albert in London. If you have any other knitting or fashion-related recommendations for us, I would love to hear them. Please email me at anne at familypodcasts.com. Of course, that's Anne with an E at familypodcasts.com. I will release episode five before the trip, and then there will be a four-week gap before episode six, because I will be gone for 10 days, just as I should be preparing and releasing it. If you have not already subscribed to the podcast through iTunes or the podcast app of your choice, I encourage you to do so, because in episode five, I will be running a little giveaway, and you don't want to miss the information about that. You will need to listen to that episode to enter, so be sure to subscribe now so you don't miss it. Thank you for listening and knitting with me for a bit. If you would like to contact me, you can email me at anne at familypodcasts.com. That's Anne with an E at familypodcasts.com. I'm on Ravelry, Instagram, Pinterest, and YouTube as I thought I knew how. Facebook as I Thought I Knew How podcast, and Twitter as at Thought I Knew How. I do have a website for the show at I Thought I Knew How familypodcasts.com. There you will find the show notes for this episode, including links to products I've mentioned and ways to support the show. Every now and then I post a blog post there too. Remember, you can help support the show by signing up for Honey using the link in the show notes for episode four. Thank you for your support. If you are a musician or no one and would like to have a song featured on the program, drop me an email and point me to where I can hear your music. You will need to be the copyright holder to be able to grant permission, so please keep that in mind. Until next time, may you be blessed with stitches that never drop, yarn without joins, and plenty of time to knit.